Um, whether his the question is whether the notoriety around his case in the movie might have been part of the reason he was put back in solitary. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I you know I would hate to speculate. One of the things that is not in the film, but you know we didn't want to put in the film because it would really be just our opinion, which is that. When he was moved out of solitary, he, he, was, he still is and has been suing the government for cruel and unusual punishment. So trying to, you know, actually has a lawsuit against them. And when he was moved out, I think it was an effort for the, you know, the state to say, look, oh, he's not in solitary, like it's not that bad. And then the judge kind of said, no, but the case still has merit. And it was kind of shortly after the judge decided that, that um, that you know they uh, they put him back in solitary. So, but again, that's that's totally my speculative opinion. But you know that that might be one of the reasons. Yeah. Right in front. Um, so your film clearly has an advocacy message about solitary confinement, but at the same time you chose to focus on human relationships and sort of the imagination and not on. I mean, even though we see the reproduction of the cell and so forth, not so much on the uh, more narrow way that an advocacy story could be told. And I guess I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you as filmmakers decided where to put your attention in a story that's so complex. So, so the question is how, where we as filmmakers decide to put our attention in a very complex story, balancing, you know, telling the story about art and friendship and imagination with the advocacy point that is quite clear in the film that I don't think solitary makes sense, you know, that solitary is a bad thing. Um, so, the, I mean, I think, you know, as filmmakers, we're first and foremost telling stories, and so that's how I look at it. Um, I come from actually a, a community organizing background, so I've done a lot of advocacy, and I've worked with a lot of advocacy groups, and I feel like you know, there are certain forms that work better for certain kinds of messages. And, you know, I also wanted this film to reach as wide an audience as possible. And I, was, and I think that we're kind of saturated with advocacy and prison films. And I was like, oh, this might, you know, this might have the potential if we tell the story differently to access, you know, a wider audience and, and different people. Uh, for me, as the producer, what really drew me to the story was that it's complicated. And I think a lot of the times uh, our mainstream media tends to paint, try to paint things in as simplistic way as possible. But I think there's a lot more ways in which art, imagination, activism, human rights, injustice, the criminal justice system, these things blend in the craziest ways all the time in so many people's lives. And I think I, I'm I like the fact that the story comes out. People don't know how to slot it. They've told us it's not activist enough for Human Rights Film Festival, it's, um, or it's too activist for the art slots. And I, I like that. I like that it's just exploding the traditional narrow boundaries, because I think the reality of our lives and our world, are, it's always complicated, and it's better to get everyone looking at all those different factors. So I'm glad that it seems to have worked. Sure, in, in the way. Um, how challenged were you by the fact that you um, so the question is how challenged we were by the fact we weren't able to film our main subject and then how did we come up with what we decided to use. Um, I was, you know, I think the challenging part with this kind of film and I think, I mean other filmmakers I've heard the Q&A for was, was actually the fun, you know, getting it funded. I mean, I'm basically saying, oh, you know, we're going to make a film about this prison, but we're never going to go inside and show the prison. We're going to make a film about this relationship, but we're never going to see the people, you know. And so that just becomes harder, a harder thing to sell. We're going to make a film about this dream house, but it's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, so this, that was more of the issue. Like, I, I kind of thought, oh, this is going to be really cool. We're going to have all this amazing audio, and we're going to get to come up with visuals. So I think more of the challenge is getting other people to buy into it. That being said, um, creating the visuals was difficult too, because, you know, when we tried to explain to people that we, at least with those animations that were done, they're actually like woodblock inked animations that this amazing animator Nicola did. You know, we were basically like, okay, well, 
We basically cut the film and left a lot of scenes black. And Herman was just talking, and you know, we would you would just see black, and you would just hear him talk. And you know, so one of our advisors was like, oh, you know, you should just leave it black for all that time. I was like, I don't think that's going to work for, for our channels that are trying to buy this and stuff. But so we talked, and we were like, well, really, what we want is we don't want you to cover the black. We want you to like enhance the black with the images. You know, he was an amazing, abstract, kind of impressionistic artist that got that, what we were trying to do, because we were really, I'm really afraid of doing anything too representational, because I don't really know what it's like. I didn't, I mean, we, that's why we really didn't even show an image of Herman, because it was like, just, you know, we wanted to keep the audience imagining, um, you know, the same way he's imagining what's, what's going on outside, you would have to imagine. Um, so that was, that was the idea, and you know, it's one that we actually went through several animators. So it also was a hard process logistically finding the right person. Um, but once we found the right person, Nico Lott, he just got it, and then it was just amazing. I mean, he came up with animations that we didn't even think of. Like, we just had those letters floating around, and he, he was like, oh, you could animate these parts up within the letters. And I was like, wow. Like, <laughs> lots of stuff we didn't think of. He, you know, he, he watched the film and came up with new ideas for animation. Okay. How much editing was done on the letters that went back and forth? Um, and how much freedom was there between their relationship and their relationship? The, the edit, how much editing was there done in the letters that went back and forth? And do you mean in the film? Or? By the prison. Yeah. Oh, by the prison. Oh, that's a great question. Sorry. So there was, it was like, you know, that's always an issue whenever you're dealing with, with the prison system. Is they, they censor everything. And, um... You know, with the basic letters, I think things were okay, but, you know, she tried to, she had these blueprints just made that I think you see, you know, they, they float across the screen or something in the film, and they wouldn't allow that to go into the prison because they were like, oh, these are some plans that, for some robbery. You know, so the, when it got actually to the house designs, uh, they were, mo they, it was harder. But when they were just, I mean, when it was just writing text, I don't, I don't know, I don't think there was that much censorship, but then again, you know, you don't always know what, what was censored, and I don't, I think most of the censorship is on what's coming into the prison versus what Herman is sending out. I don't, I don't, having received some letters, I haven't had any censored. Okay. Oh, that's it, that's it. But we're still around, so come, come, come outside and talk to us. Yeah, thank you again. And we'll just be around the corner in the restaurant.